Croito is channeled by fluid. Welcome back to the lands of fire. Yes, we are returning to the uh, world of pre-colonial Australian mythology with a slightly furry twist. I hope you've been enjoying it so far. I definitely have been. Anyway, for, it has been a while for those of you who don't quite remember. We ended the previous episode with the defeat of the Sun Woman. So let's pick things up from the scene right after that one. Five years passed, and it's still hard to get used to the cycles of day and night. I yawn and do my morning routine. It's winter, so the outback so far away from the coast isn't as unpleasant as I thought it'd be. Still, I much prefer my home in the southern coastline. I hear footsteps and I recline sexily. What were you two up to? I built a new houses. I would crack a sex joke, but it's honestly pretty satisfying. We're finally healing from all of this. Her roar beams with pride. And Pantway was still short on people, but it was growing. Monsters still roam the land, but they're scattered without the Sun Woman to direct them, and with farming resuming, the effects of drought are lessened with each passing season. Feels a bit too good to be true, but I don't care. We deserve this. I decide to stretch my legs and admire the scenery. Under daylight my power is weakened, but just as the moon can still be seen at day, so I am still a god. Every night I return to the sky, but these short winter days are perfect to visit those I love. And it seems my lovers agree. When you instigates it, embracing me from behind and nibbling at my neck. I whimper and I find a nearby wattle tree to lean on. We rest, sitting down and watching the horizon. From here I can see Mount Attila towering over the plains. My lovers can't, for it's too far away from mortal eyes. The nearby view is impressive just the same. But I can't help but fixating on it. An evil spirit of ice and winter, Ninja, dwells there. And although Mount Attila's side is much warmer than when Pantui, this time of the year the nights are just cold enough for it to get out. I hate that thing already. I want to break that mountain god's kneecaps and... You okay, Kubadang? Yeah, love. You seem a bit stressed. Given how good I am, I feel a bit insulted. I kick him playfully, for leaning on him and dragging Winyu to me. Feels so nice to have two people you love hugging you like this. So I feel like I'm disappointing my beloved Winyu and Perul by not being comforted enough. Mount Attila... Ninja needs to be taught a lesson. Perul nodded. It's winter and the Sun Woman can no longer intimidate into compliance. Our nation's are rebuilding. We can't let that thing ruin this, after all we've done. Perul's combative as always, but I can feel a sliver of pain in his voice. Our battle with the Sun Woman took eternities, took a toll on our minds we just barely process. We need to heal, but it seems like our break is over. Well, mine is. I stay here. I'll kill that fucker. Kubadang, we promised we'd be by each other's sides. I nuzzle him, giving him a sense of security. Then I fly away. I can hear them shouting after me, which only adds to my guilt. The sooner I deal with this, the sooner they'll have paradise. I arrive at Mount Attila's Peak. Even with the hot tropical air, the summit feels oddly cold, like far south in my home in Mount Gulaga. It doesn't take me long to spot the other deity. It is shaggy, with a white coat like bones. Okra adorns its marsupial mole-like face, devoid of eyes and bearing sharp teeth and claws. It smiles grotesquely, bloody entrails and bile spewing out of its mouth, falling on frozen ground. How brazen you seem. You're hoping to kill me. You threaten the hard work my lovers have put in into rebuilding, what your kind has destroyed. I guess I could warn you to stay put, but where's the fun in that? Ninja laughed hideously, like the sound of an avalanche crushing bones. 
Now a warning for you, so you might want to calm down. You may be a god, so let go of your childish temper. A warning? Is that why you drew attention to yourself? No, I do intend to leave the mountain. No sooner do I hear that than I use the blunt end of my boomerang to crack his arm and leg bones. Ninja winters in pain and loses his demeanour. He shivers in fear and in spite of the lack of eyes I can feel an odd sense of betrayal from him, which makes me feel sorry for the ice abomination. The warning? Mamu is coming. Far from the desert, in the coastal swamps, Bina treads the waters. Come out, I don't have time for your bullshit. Her voice laughs, mirthy yet bearing a cruelty that drive lesser beings mad, fear rot in their minds. To Bina, old and powerful she was, it's annoying more than anything. And yet, you're here. Face it, you are curious. You need to know my scheme, see them unfold. Bina sighs. And it's true. All gods, witnesses to the drama's eternal, are fated to play the observer at some point. Bina should know better. Had she not averted catastrophe? But in the end, her actions are an aberration. She much prefers to simply watch events unravel. My, my, you're so quiet. Have you used all of your wits? I won't ask again. Show yourself, or Bain will know you're here. He isn't as bright as the sun, but his light will still leave nasty scars on your pretty face. Who knows? Maybe then you won't look like a wombat shit piled into a person. The voice laughs, but his soul loses laughter. Insects begin to crawl along the mangrove roots, falling down to the water around Bina. Ah, how I miss your temper tantrums. Or just reveal yourself, you are beyond embarrassing. Darkness envelops the swamp, as if the blackest of nights erupt immediately from the sky. Not even the faint glimmers of stars remain. This is the most empty part of the spirit world pouring into the swamp. Rot and decay fill the air. Insects and other crawlers grow in boulder and devouring all life around Bina. Bird nests, emptied of egg and chick. Fish, blood drained by parasitic isopods. Wild wallabies and possums reduce their skeletons as maggots erupt from within. Locusts gnaw into the very foundations of trees. Even spiders, normally keeping these creatures in check, live a powerful venom to all who aren't his creations. Their maker, the most hateful of the gods, steps out of the shadows, into the now oily waters. It's so detestable to walk into this world that should have been mine. And here we go, all contributed to the creation of all things. As amusing as it'll be to listen to your childish tantrums, don't waste my time. I won't. Sit and watch, Copper Serpent One. You'll be quite entertained. After warning the tribes along the land, I finally returned to my birth home. My sister and Dura are the first to greet me, hugging me tight. Oh, it's been a while, Moonhead. I always thought you'd forgotten about your people. So you're blind now, since apparently you can't see me in the sky. Good that he hits my shoulder playfully, I consider responding in kind. When the elders return. Gubadang, it's been so long, my child. Warangra is as grandfatherly as ever, hugging me tightly. But my feelings are only more bitter after spending so much time with my fallen friend. They hold no resentment towards their father. They shrug this whole ordeal with their typical bravado, but I'm not so quick to forgive. I say nothing, hoping the silence will turn this awkward. My pettiness works, perhaps a bit too well since even Goodity and Tura are uncomfortable. So, so, so uh, yes, we, we missed you a lot. Um, me, more so than anyone else. I take my cue to hold him tightly, nuzzling into his neck, earning him a modest moan. Ah, uh, young love, how come you don't hold me like that anymore? Because you don't ask, you silly gum eater. They hug and cuddle like they were young men, but to me their age matters more than it should. 
I notice all the wrinkles, all the flaws, like the skin of a maggot rotting under the sun, cursor light. I feel myself profoundly disgusted, like ants are biting at my heels and digging into my belly and chest, urging me to throw up. I feel myself grimace. My fist tightens. Oh, you two look so lovely together. Oh, thank you, dear, dear. And it's lovely we spent so much work, time worrying for each other's lives. We've got how to live. More like you've got how to die, you disgusting murderous excuses for elders. Why am I being like this? Night falls soon, and we gather at the fireplace, cosy into the stars for the first time in years. Dura leans on to me and we enjoy a quiet moment, resting in each other's necks. I feel calm, my nagged answer threatens to boil every so often. You feel all right, my love. You've been very stressed. Are your godly duties tiring? I chuckle as softly as possible. No, it's just I'm feeling weird for some reason. I'm sure it will pass. Oh, come on, Kubadang. If you're not feeling well, we should always check it. You're free to veal me up if you want. Any mood more typical of goodity punches me in the shoulder. Granted, softly, as the cute platypus with flippers for hands as he is, for it's still more adventurous than usual for him, so I can't help but feel proud. A pervert? And you wouldn't have it any other way? No, I wouldn't. Retreat my gunya, newly rebuilt after my long absence. Dura undresses himself when we play lightly. He seems interested, but he's clearly tied out, so he settles for laying his head on my chest. You know, your heartbeat feels nice on the beak, like the lightning of fish movements. Thanks, I guess. Also, Miss Winyu, it's weird not to have him here looking out for me. He'll be back soon. In the meantime, you might have noticed other guys aren't giving you as much trouble as before. You'll have something to do with that? Well, most of the time they're simply happy things are back to normal. Occasionally that quarrel gets ideas, so I make him trip on his own shadows. You're wonderful in the most mean way possible. And you wouldn't have it any other way. Well, you could be less arrogant and abrasive. Otherwise, yeah, you're perfect. I'm not sure I believe that myself. I'm busy. Busy sticking out my tongue playfully at him. Busy approaching my face, threatening to lick him. Ew, stop. He pushes me away firmly, sorting me away like he'd swap no one else. Again, I'm proud of his progress. Well, I'll sleep with you, but first I need to oversee the coast. Uh, all right. Dura looks positively deflated. I feel like my heart is being pierced out of its blood. Like I said, we'll be together tonight. Just have to do this quick, okay? He nods, hugging me briefly but tightly. While not as strong as Winyu, he does have a true swimmer's strength, and I feel his hug even as I ascend. The coast is lovely today, bioluminescent critters filling the waters with blue light. It almost reminds me of the spirit world's oceans, and I'm sure both exist in a continuum somewhere. Though it is located in the sky, it is connected to the mortal world in many complex ways. Like layers of water, separate yet mixing here and there. The tide is low. The waves are whispers. Far ahead, the Yorko continue their duty, turning into many forms, from the foam of waves to large dugongs. I can see the fins of orcas, and I'm tempted to go pet them. I promise this will be quick. I promise you can't keep. I feel something crawling in my spine, inside and out. Reminds me of the sensation I had earlier, except far more intense as if actual insects are crawling along my bones. Wing beats and screeches fill the air, and pestilence surrounds me everywhere. The air is thick with the scent of rot, then actual wing beats. Beetles and locusts land on my face, biting at my eyelids. Swatting them away is easy, but I realise in horror that something is moving inside me, eating at my esophagus. I vomit violently, blood almost eclipsed by hundreds if not millions of maggots and tapeworms. I'm shaking, 
both in terror and because things inside my body are biting at my every joint. I reach the shadows. No, they answer. I can feel them far more hateful tonight. Only under my control because I'm pissed off enough to meet their standards. I lacerate myself with my boomerang, allowing water and darkness to cleanse my flesh. The wounds will take a while to close themselves. But the flow and clotting are enough to keep the crawlers from getting in. Not that they stop trying, swarming around me, making the night darker than the absence of light. I need to get away from this, but the swarm would follow me to the village. That's why it's so fun to play with. You, your... Someone, if you got to mention your beloved tribe, who will no doubt be unprepared for my loveliest to penetrate their flesh. How amusing. You're so busy lovemaking, you fail to protect them against someone who can actually fuck them. I killed your rival. I can kill you as well. The sun rises and sets. That evil will exist long after I win and destroy what should be my creation. This is what you create. I can see why yeah, the gods think you're a shit artist. This seems to generally piss him off, and the swarm doubles down at trying to get in from the outside and trying to manifest on the inside. I hurl water at them, shredding their forms into nothingness. Shitty creations, too. You're really pathetic, you know that? But suddenly I'm left without breath. The shadows, until then under my command, wrestle away from my will and their touch becomes draining. Air seems to leave my lungs, my muscles lose strength. I have to will myself alive, it's becoming increasingly harder. Your smugness is adorable, like the petty tantrums of a child. It's why you'll make a very fine toy. He leans down, stroking my cheek gently, which somehow still draws blood. As a creature of shadows, you will serve me well. But for now, I say we play a more personal game. His antennae touch my face, the equivalent of him taking in my scent. Though dull, his eyes convey the same sort of ecstatic lust. My efforts to remain alive redouble. Fear does that. Kill everyone you love, or I shall kill them anyways. What else can I do? I can't beat him. Killing the sun has given me illusions of strength. Empathetic. So very, very fucking pathetic. Your scent is exquisite, my pawn. Ah, but I should learn to enjoy foreplay. Kill them. Now. The skies are alight with the sudden lights. They are a sign of disaster, the spirit world's equivalent for wildfire. Souls flee from the flames as much as they did from the Sun Woman. All but one. Stay strong, Kubadang. I'll fist that motherfucker. I return to my gunya, silent as the shadows. Dura is asleep, snoring peacefully. I guess I took too long. A very petty part of me is mad at him, but mostly I'm despairing. It's either my boomerang or mom whose children will devour my lover. Or worse. So, so much worse. A Stalin? Ah, all the better. But I grow bored. Go on with it. My hold on my weapon threatens to break it. Seeing him laying innocently. I can't do it. I honestly can't. And so I hear the swarm approaching. I feel them crawling over my paws, under my skin and out of the corner of my eyes like the most painful tears. My love for him could have given him a peaceful end. But instead he's going to be eaten alive. Quick, go down inside. What? Just then Dura's boomer boomerang hit Mamu, the impact and ochre alike burning the evil god's skin. Tura's boomerang corrals Mamu away, hitting him multiple times. 
A battle cry heralds the arrival of my sister, who further bashes her axe on the evil god. Stunned, I wondered how they could be so well prepared. I noticed a small flicker of light amidst the stars still visible in the southern lights. A wink, and I couldn't help but cry. They probably told my loved ones what was going on while they dreamt. Of all the confusing time-warping qualities of the spirit world, this one is the most heartwarming. And the one most blood-quickening. My, my, the guy who wanted to make me his tool is getting pounded by the creations he hates so much. Now for round two. I punch his disgusting insect face with a hilt of my boomerang, creating a sickening sound of a breaking exoskeleton. Then I splice his limbs, then clearly torn off, but bleeding profusely, maggots and tapeworms forming a viscous liquid from his wounds. The others keep hitting him, breaking limbs and burning skin with their own ochre body paint. Soon the whole tribe joins in. What a pathetic god. Even the sun put more of a fight than you, you disgusting little maggots. Enough! Insects can't swarm the air with so many pulverise them with their weapons. But the shadows expel life and breath from our bodies, making us fall to the ground. But now, reinvigorated by love and taking advantage of Mamu's weakness, the shadows bend to my will, and it is he who starts to have his life drained, drained to strengthen the tribe's bodies. He coughs, black oil that passes through his blood dripping from his eyes and mouth. Evil is eternal. I'll rot your hearts. I'll rot your precious little bonds. You will all die alone, suffering for all eternity. Pitiful creations. He vanishes into the shadows like a strained thought gone in the mind. It's clear that I think it was but temporary. You think? Oh, not now. The grown-ups are talking. You said it yourself. He almost made you his slave and made you kill your lovers and sister. That asshole says that in the most sincere, gentle voice I can think of. So unlike him. It makes me furious, but I don't want to start a scene. Right now I just check on Tura, holding him tight in my arms. He smiles sweetly, but I can tell he's sad. Considering what I almost did to him, it's a rather forgiving response. One that I do not deserve. I nestle against him, trying to comfort him. We need a Corbina. Why that cranky old bitch? Any of the gods can help us now. The night connects us to the spirit world. It is true, and Darimodum listens to our prayers vividly. We are his, and he is ours. Yulu came in, waving the bull roarer. A sound I've only seldomly heard from that ceremony that changed my life. Oh, great Daramulam, husband of stars, hero of man, one-legged one, of the skies and forests, bravest of the gods in war and hunt, we beg of you to use your tricks to defile Mamu and save your people. It is of no use. Of course you'd show up. I miss you too, Looney, but we uh, have urgent matters to discuss. I don't understand. Why can't Daramulam help us? He is helping. Stretch thin hunting that thing at his shadows. But he can be corrupted by Mamu, so I pray to myself that you don't find him in such a state. What about you? I saw your conversation with that monster. You just want to watch? Venus sighs but stands proud. Yes, this time I will only watch. The Sun Woman threatened all of humanity, but I want to see where Mamu's schemes lead. You don't care about those lives that'll be lost. How can you just sit and watch when you helped us before? My dear, because I do as I will. And I want to see this through. Oh, fuck you. Bina doesn't respond. She simply sits down, playing with the staff. We must go to Mpantui. Parole and his warriors will be more than enough to kick the shit out of Mamu. I open a portal, as if the lunar disc was right before us. Tura, Giddity and a few human warriors all walk in, but I close it before Bina can cross. Once this is over, I'll personally rip her self-righteous head from her shoulders. This won't stand. It's bad if that fucker is doing our rest, but he won't live out of what he's done. He hugs me tighter and I sigh. 
he said it. We should be resting, but I guess this world isn't done screwing us over. Are you sure we should mount an ambush here? It could be anywhere. True. I feel he's not done playing games with us. He'll come after me and the Arante have just enough warriors and Kodacha to put up a fight. Terry, that's a new one, you mean? I hope so. He needs to die, and if possible, painfully. When you look at me sadly. I wish it could be better for him, but I'm not in the mood. Besides, the last time any attempt at mercy, I almost lost Bangalore. We gather in the war, Wiltshire. Harul and Arunti elders and warriors sit alongside you and warriors, the others from other nations, deciding our war strategy. So, he seems not to have gathered any armies yet. I doubt he will. He much favours his creation to anything made by the other gods. Still, we uh, cannot be idle. Joe, which is a shame. I'd much rather kill monsters than having tapeworms crawl on my ass. How do we even fight against a plague like that? Leave that to me in the Kodacha. I was overwhelmed by his attacks, but with help I can make sure it doesn't infect anyone. Yeah, we should work to conceal our medicine men. The warriors can be a distraction. Me and Kibberdang will personally tell Marmo's head off and rid this world of his evil. Your hatred is your greatest strength, as warrior and Kodacha. But Marmo is the master of hatred. Best to keep the moon god safe. A thought occurs to me. I frown since it's from that traitor's mouth. Marmu can corrupt other gods, can he not? The elders sigh. Yes, hope he'd be too prideful to do that. If he does, we are fucked. We wait. Winter chill and shorter days add my uneasiness. The cold southern winds grazing against my skin. Tura paces while I, Winyu and Perul rest. Their warmth is like the smallest ember before a sea storm. Tura, please sit down. You're going to burst your feet if you keep going like that. I can't. He's going to strike at any moment. How do you expect me to just sit down? Well, I tried. Tura, it hurts me to see you like this. Just lay next to us. Perul pats the ground, gently like his voice. Seeing his softer side would normally be sweeter than honey, but I feel numb. Tura joins us, nuzzling against me in Perul. Perul pets him gently, rubbing his paw on his neck. We say nothing for a while, just enjoying each other's company. Eventually I start to doze off. When you notices this and positions himself so I can rest on Perul's pecs while he embraces me from the back. He whispers something. I can't quite make it out, tired of everything as I am. The night ends, but the shadow remains cast. I wake up in a wetland of some sort. My feet are frozen with a sheer cold, so I sprint, wincing. Wherever I go, I can't find warmer, drier ground. The further I go, the further I find hills and valleys, their slopes still covered with still freezing water. When I feel as earthbound as when I was a mortal, I somehow don't trip over or fall. It seems as though I wade while remaining in the air, my head well above the reeds. All the places I've been to and dreams I've had, this is the one I find hardest to wrap my head around. The cold spreading into my head doesn't help either. I wander about, the slopes becoming steeper and blurrier. Water at least now behaves more normally, staying within layered pools along the canyons. Still, I hate this place. Why am I here? Why are we all here? Ah, figures. Still, she looks and feels... odd. Darkness clings to her. I feel like a controller like a doll, but I restrain myself. I want an explanation. Nothing ever ends. Not the sun, not evil, not you. Shadows and entropy. Void bark in a desperate voice. Reminiscing the future. The fuck? Even by her standards, this is weird. It's as though she's not here, 
as though I'm seeing her corpse. Lena? Her its head tilts grotesquely, marrow spilling across her torso. Her scars flow with blood, but doesn't fall. It hangs immobile like the waters before. A curious name, a curious lie. Wunger sends regards. All right, asshole, explain yourself or die. A rumbling sound like that of the Sun Woman's lackeys threatens to break my bones, but I won't have it. Even here, water and shadow yield to me. We're done. I tear it to shreds. And it reforms into a familiar but grotesque sight. Why her shape? Whatever. Die as many times as you need. But I won't end. It laughs. A bird-like sound has a strange raspiness to it. As if something made by hands. I consider leaving. This is somewhere where the spirit world touches the mortal one. I think I can get some knowledge from this... thing. You don't belong to Marmu, do you? I think many insects belong to him. But he can twist as he wants. Ah, a corrupted god. But not Bina. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. But some part of me hope that she's alright for whatever fucking reason. I'm sorry this happened to you. It doesn't respond. Were you warning me of Marmu's schemes? Evil schemes always, but it cannot think. I try to stifle a chuckle. This poor thing isn't thinking straight, but calling Marmu stupid is amusing. Thank you. Go in peace. It leaves. I stay still for a moment longer. The worst case scenario will happen, apparently. How will we face the gods? The many monsters almost wiped out humanity. We can't possibly win against the twisted forms of those we revere. If only Beanie didn't decide to let everything go to shit, she'd know the answer. I'm not allowed to gather my thoughts for long. A Dula gal wanders towards me, seemingly wading sky high as I am. It's no threat, but watching it walk towards me still makes my head hurt. Casually I look between its legs and... Oh. I recoil in disgust. I will its blood to burst from its body, rendering its flesh to red mud instantly. I cake myself with its blood, its power and life sorely needed if I am to win this war. I wake up full of energy. When you cuddles me, nothing gently against my forehead. Where is everybody? Farrell went to practice his rituals. Toro went to have a swim. I could use one myself, so we figured taking turns while waiting for you to wake up. Nonsense. Go take a bath. You need one. He playfully smacks my ass. He calling me smelly? Yes. Well, you don't want to talk. Sure you know that your balls stink and you're stuck inside of a pouch all day. Sure you know water does my will so I can get washed without you even noticing. Well, you're not doing a good job. Come on, let's have a bath. We make our way to a billabong amidst the desert cliffs. In part we may be arid, the Arente keep good track of water reservoirs and maintain them. Not as intricate as the artificial lakes of Butch Bim, but it has its own beauty. The water is clear and there are a few small fish darting about. Thura is swimming ahead, seemingly chasing after him before he notices us. Oh, you're awake. Before I can say a witty remark, he hugs me. Can't say I like cold water in the middle of winter, but I feel warm nonetheless. And the moment's gone. Oh, thanks, bro. Can the water go with It's wonderful. Yeah, I'll pass, thank you very much. Oh, you're no fun. And yet you still beg for me. What was that for? A stinky. Take a bath. No. Oh, not you too. Sorry, he's my brother. Family has to stick for family. And they keep on splashing me. Assholes. Oh, come on, don't leave. We were just... 
A large wave engulfs them both. A oh, cheetah. I walk around the village for a while, seeing if I can make myself useful. I come across a wheelchair where a group of people are gathered with coolmons full of unelegant Thai caterpillars. They are grinding them together with a pestle and water, making moth meat cakes. I join them, sitting down beside a possum woman. I quite enjoy it in Thai cakes, a lot sweeter than the bagong moths down south. After they're done, we place them in an earth oven, allowing them to bake. And when the first to take the effort of hard labour, they'll regrettably only take one bite of my cake. The rest I take as a gift. Figured you'd be done by now. Missed you and the boys. He hugs me tightly. I want to retort, but I feel he's probably not in the mood for my well-renowned wit. Something on your mind, love? I stroke his face gently and he leans into my hand. Every second will be the last I see you. I've lost too much already. And you've regained it, and Pantwe is thriving. Your tribe is the home of the fierce warriors that will fell Marmu. He sighs. Yeah, my tribe was once attacked by Papin and Juari. I stiffen, knowing where this will lead. Did you lose someone important? Many. My brothers, my father, my son. I'm so sorry. He hugs me tighter, burying his head on my shoulder. I feel a few tears and I nuzzle against him. I saw him right, bef- rot right before me. One of those one-eyed fuckers licked his wounds and got inside him, making him decay until he's ashen bones. It was slow. S- so slow. I couldn't even comfort him as he fell apart, crying for me. Taramulam. Tura told me that almost happened to you. I don't know if I can handle it all this time. It won't happen, my love. I already... A sharp pain shoots through my spine. No sooner than I yell that Parole inspects me and notices the locust is crawling its way out of my back. I grab it and I smash it against the ground, using his liquefied body to paint a moon crescent. This was a warning from him, but I got it out. It won't happen again, I promise. He's getting impatient, though. We should be ready. I already am, my love. Clouds gathered in Uluru, where once the Sun Woman's light shone on horrific torments. It is now where Marmu plots. The light still stains this place. No matter. She is dead while you... are not. Halt. His troops do so. They expect the worst and ready their weapons. I will scout. Before he finishes, half of them are crushed at once. Bangalore surges about frantically and finds the answer. The sky is falling, the hands of Bayam stained with the blood of his worshippers. I'm done playing games. Hand over my beloved or die. He laughs, the sound like worms digging between the spaces of my bones. Even after all this time, you make empty threats. Reckon you will never cease to be old. Again and again, your arrogant last thinks he can stand against me. Again, he's rotted from the inside out. Pray tell, what would you prefer? Me to straight up kill your pathetic sex toys? Or have the gods do it? I don't respond. At least not with words. What was once desert now floods. Orcas swim above what was once dry land, grabbing the limbs of Marmu. And drag him down. He struggles but he has no plagues to call upon. Not here, where water and darkness alike rule. Where I rule. I'm impressed. You drowned your people just to get at me. You think you won, but all the death, all the destruction... That, motherfucker! 
deadly baffled god of evil has no response. Not when Parole is filling his face with punch after punch. Can you hold him here? No problem. Parole and Wenyu are doing their punching. I'll try to restrict his movement to my boomerang. Gary, we need to free Daramulam. I nod and I surface. I'm back home, so far away. Or is it home? To achieve my trick I broke down the barriers of the spirit world and the mortal realm, flooding yet not flooding, allowing my people to breathe on only half real water. Ha! Ah, the joys of recursive reality. But it doesn't matter. I can feel him here just as I did in the Kuringal. Just as I did in the spirit world. The world darkens, but still starlight remains. I'd like to think my god is not too far gone, but there he is, wielding a boomerang like my own, blood dripping from it. He's still beautiful, still adorned with emu feathers. His eyes are black with a red-white epicenter, a tiny light on the verge of being extinguished. You hold yourself back, beloved Darumulam. Hold still a little long... He lunges at me. I evade each attack, but he's gaining on me. Eventually his boomerang hits my leg. I heal it before it is snapped off completely, but I still falter. And I am at his mercy. Now, Kubadang! I can't fucking believe it. She's helping us. I indeed waste no more time. As I learn from Darumulam, no less, the light too is within the moon's grasp. The shadows now feed a flare so bright it melts my eyes and forces Bina to look away. Darumulam is disoriented. As he comes to his senses, it is truly him again. What just... I'm sorry, there's no time. We need to defeat Marmu now. He shakes his head. If we could, we would have done so. You can only hope to fight him forever like with the Sun Woman. I am willing to help you. Of course, it comes down to this again. I knew this was the only logical outcome. But even as time means nothing in the spirit world, I wonder if I can keep doing this to all my problems. I already stole one light from away from the people I love. And now I have to do it again? Do any of you know where Bangalore is? I am holding prisoner. I can free him. Yes, do that. It's the least you can do after being such a cunt. She huffs indignantly. There's a look of sadness in her eyes. Whatever, we can talk this later. Or forever, I guess. We follow down into the sky, the most common barrier between the two worlds. Aim's presence suffuses the air, not surprisingly as we are in his domain. I search among the clouds for some hint of Bangalore. This seems to provoke the Sky God, who throws blasts of air in my direction. Any moment now, Bina. True to a word, she steps in front of me, blocking the winds. Flames of all colours fill the air, purging the evil within my aim. But it isn't enough, so I add my own shadows. And turn them to light. Did it work? A gust of wind answers my question. The Vangalar is now free and flies in front of me. Greatest and dearest of the gods, please stay your hand. I know you are in there somewhere, even as Mamu eats at your mind. You saved as many of your warriors as you killed, my own life in debt to the path of you that keep fighting. Fight, fight against the corruption, just as you extend your hand on the battlefield. It is useless. Your efforts were amusing, but... Now, strike while I hold him. I take a deep breath. I really, really want to torture the crap out of him. Make him feel every injury, every dread, every depravity he's caused since the dawn of time. But I know I don't have another chance like this. 
Lella, Vangala, Parul, Winyu, Zura, Gudati, and indeed even the elders I will never forgive. They need to live. My lust for revenge fizzles like incense flames, replaced by a grim glare. First I strike into and beyond his chest, cutting his flesh across all time. Then I burn him with moonlight, severing him from the spirit world. His essence fades across the dreaming, the wildfires that are his sudden light slowly dissipating. He might return one day, reformed from all evil in humanity's heart. But for now I'm alone in the shadows, my domain. I wake up as I did, gods know how long ago. I'm not alone this time. Angela snores to my right, Tura to my left. It was a fairly uneventful night, all of us too tired to do much celebrating. But cutting both of them, now that's a hero's reward. Familiar footsteps awake me from my already fading sleep, another beloved face comes by. Oh, still as lazy as ever? Fuck off, I'm allowed to rest. No, you're not. You're going to stand as witness to the Kuringal, remember? Shit. The perks of being a god do not make up for the duties. I drag a coolum on and will its waters splash my face. I do my usual dental routine with herbs. I guess I don't need to go through all this trouble, but I'm still of my people, of the Ewan. Darumulum remains our patron god, for I cannot be bound to nations. With the moon shall forever be on it here, and the Kuringal rites and stories will see me as an important figure for the rest of time. This is my home, and I bless it every night. Monsters do not dare come here with the blessings of two gods. Good morning, my cuties. Good morning, my love. Good morning, Stinky. They both hug me and I nestle into their embrace. I help clean them up, washing their faces and bodies, sprinkling them with a mixture of wattle and gum flowers and leaves. Neither of them have teeth, so cleaning the mouths is fairly simple. As we're all ready, we join Goodity. Dearest brother, follow the example of your boyfriends. They clearly clean up better than you. Well, he did help us. But he didn't help himself. Still stinky. Oh, tell me about it. Traitor? More like on his level, love. I roll my eyes. We follow the exact same path as the one that started my story. I can't help but tear up a little. You okay, Kubadang? Yeah, I'm fine. Just... This is how it all started so long ago. Tura nodded wistfully. It is an honour to be invited to such a ceremony. Well, you're my family now, unless you're allowed to witness. Just don't spread what you see around here, all right? May my breath halt forever if I do. I nestle against him. His honour is so cute. As much as I remembered, only my place now is different. I rise to the top of the mounds, joining the other sky gods in overseeing the ceremony. Bangala, Tura, Winyu and Parul all join the older men to guide and instruct the youths. To my delight, there are so many boys this time, ready to take their first step into manhood. The fire roars. Then the bull roarer coaxes in beloved Darumulum to appear. He smiles at me, beaming in pride of what I have become. The ceremony continues, my lovers dancing and shouting to mark the different stages and encouraging the boys in the trials ahead. I'm so proud of them too. The young are put on, on their holes, Muranga takes their teeth. My lovers shout and encourage, distracting away from the pain that I once felt, and which prompts me to rub my jaw. Parola is of course unimpressed. He probably thinks this is a scratch compared to our ente rights. But still he swallows his pride and keeps encouraging. That's why I love that assholeish but well-meaning kangaroo. At last we celebrate. Back then I got so drunk on gum cider, and many young men still do. And I do take a Kulamon with me, 
I laugh at it only every once in a while. I'm high on something else. Something that drives me to be the best version of myself. Something that can only come if you nurture others. Something that can only happen with honesty and consideration. Something that ends up in the best goddamn sex there is. Love. I love them so much. For all time. That was Lands of Fire in the original iteration, as it says on the screen here. That uh, said, has been very interesting. The uh, mythology of uh, pre-colonial Australia is not something I'm particularly familiar with. I know some odds and ends which I've picked up over the years. So reading this has been very, very interesting. I think mythology, particularly lesser-known mythology with a furry twist, is uh, something that should be uh, looked into a bit more. It might make some... Very interesting stories. After all, these stories are ancient. It just goes to prove that storytellers are long been a part of humanity. I would definitely love to see more of this kind of thing, and also more from uh, Lands of Fire as well. Just imagine if we go back into my personal kind of mythology from my land, Bran, played by an actual raven, because it's a furry vision. That would be interesting to see. Furry Mabinogi. Uh, I don't have the time to work on that. I certainly can't do the drawing, but I know that's an interesting idea. So I have to say thanks for uh, doing this. I have to say very much enjoyed it. I hope you all have uh, enjoyed this short series. And uh, please do follow Lands of Fire on itch.io and you can see what else is going on in this world and what plans there are for it. Uh, will we go back to it if there's a lot more? Uh, let's find out what happens first and uh, see where we go from there. But uh, it's definitely possible. I'll be keeping an eye on the creator here. But that is it for now. Uh, just to mention that there'll be no weekday video coming up. I am a little busy. But uh, on the weekend, we'll be returning to Ocean Avenue. Dirk the Red Panda's visual novel. So we'll be uh, doing a short scene that's been added to day three and then we'll be going on the new update which you may have read so we can do that then and I've actually planned some stuff for June now because I realised in the last month I had nothing on the go but before I leave as always thanks to all my donors on Kofi and Patreon I very much appreciate you all especially with uh, times being tough for pretty much everyone these days so uh, if you are a patron and you're thinking ah oh, can I keep doing this if you can't please just Put yourselves first, as always. I can uh, carry on. It's fine. I do appreciate what it's like for everyone. So 
you know, if you need to uh, drop your patron support for a while, forever, that's good. I understand what's going on, so don't worry about me. Ah, my top patrons I always have to thank are Burnt Toast, Kartek, Gopas Vissa, Esuksu, Lark Eskerton, Astian, Ryan Hall, Gunnamulla, Tiger Cub, Ida Corval, Anubis Silverwind, Brandon Bradford, Dissonance, Grizz, Spiderling, Kopi, Cindy Dragonwolf, Marcus, Evan King, and Molly. Till we return with Ocean Avenue in a few days. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.